Well, my name is Jim, and it has been for quite a few years now, <laughs> about 57 of them next month. So uh, the library, friends of the library asked me to come down and do ghost stories tonight. Been really looking forward to this. At one time a year, I get to tell these stories to people other than my wife. <laughs> so I've really been looking forward to it. Um, I'll, I do have some local stuff mixed in, and then I've got some other things that I've uh, got some tales I decided to tell tonight that I've never told in public. So it's going to be a good night. Just remember the age group. The age group. <laughs> this crowd over here, especially. <laughs> okay. The first story is, uh, I guess you would say it's a beware or buyer beware type of story. A lady named Karen wanted to buy a house, and it was going to be her first home purchase. And, of course, the names have been changed on all this. And uh, she was scouting around looking for a house, and she found a house that she particularly liked. It was owned by an old widower. Uh, she visited the house, and he showed her around, and nice little brick ranch house. And he told her his children had all grown up and left the house, and his wife had left him 20 years ago. So he was living there alone, and he was going to downsize. So they reached an agreement on the deal and signed the papers, and she was moving in and decided what she was going to paint and how she was going to rearrange things. And the first night in the bedroom, she had fell asleep, didn't even have the mattress set up yet. It was just sitting on the floor. She fell asleep on the mattress, and sometime during the night, something disturbed her. And she woke up, and she rolled over, and there was a woman standing at the foot of the bed. Just looked like an average person. And Karen looked at her and said, uh, what are you doing in here? And the woman just looked at her and shook her head. And Karen said, can I help you with something? And the woman just shook her head. And all of a sudden, she just rose up and went right straight through the ceiling. Now, Karen got up and turned on the lights then and scared and looked around. And she thought, okay, I've dreamed this. So the next day, she spent all day cleaning and sitting things up the way she wanted to get her, her mattress and stuff set up with a real bed. And she was laying there that night and fell dead asleep because of you know, being exhausted. And then same thing happened. Something woke her up and she looked that back and there was a woman standing at the foot of the bed, same woman. And she shook her head and closed her eyes and shook her head thinking I'm seeing this and the woman just continued to look at her. And she once again said, can I do something for you? And the woman shot right straight up through the ceiling, just slowly went up out of sight. Well, that scared her. So she got up, turned on all the lights, pulled the ladder down, went up in the attic and looked around. And she was shining a flashlight. There were no lights in the attic, so she was shining her flashlight around. And she saw little beady eyes looking back at her. And she quickly realized she had a little problem with rats. So she called the exterminator the next day, and she told him that she had a problem, infestation, and the man came and he looked around in the flashlight in the attic and saw the rat eyes too and said, yeah, you got a problem with rats. He said, we'll be back <clears throat> in two days to, to eradicate this rat problem. So that night, she went to bed still wondering what in the world was causing all that. And same time at the night she awoke, the woman standing at the foot of the bed, and she carefully looked at the woman this time. The woman looked very forlorn, uh, tears almost in her eyes. And once again, she said, can I help you? And the woman just went right up, straight up through the ceiling. Well, she couldn't figure out what was going on. She called the, the exterminator and she said, look, is there any way you could come today? She said, uh, I, I, she thought it was connected to the rats. So the exterminator said, yeah. So they got there, and they got to spraying around, and they got up in the attic, and they got off into one corner of the attic, exactly above where the woman stood in the bedroom, and they found a body. Oh, no. Uh, they, of course, called the police, and the body had been completely covered in lime to keep the odor down. And the police came and identified the body, and it was the widow's wife, or what he said had left him. 20 years before, he killed her and stuffed her in the attic. And there is no uh, statute of limitations for murder. So they got him. 
Was that scary enough? <laughs> yeah, that's kind of creepy, yeah. <laughs> I thought I heard the train coming, so I... <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next one then. <laughs> I didn't lose anybody yet, right? <laughs> uh, this next one is one that I have never told in public. Um, I taught at John C. Campbell Folk School Oh, almost over a 20-year period. I was down there a week long every year. One of the times I disappeared from town, I, <laughs> I was down there teaching. John C. Campbell Folk School was established in 1925. Um, John Campbell and his wife, uh, uh, let's see, her name was Olivia, uh, had traveled all up and down the Appalachian Mountains in 1900 in a wagon. And they were determined to help the Appalachians. And they were looking at a folk school type of thing to show the local people how they could um, use their skills and stuff to promote Appalachia and to help them, you know, like bottoming chairs and wood carving and folk crafts and stuff like that. So John Campbell died before they could ever get it going. There's the train. And so they decided on Brasstown, North Carolina as the place to establish this school. So he was dead. Olive Campbell procured the land. We're going to have to just stop till they get past. <laughs> well, I can keep talking about the school. So they established the school, and it continued to grow over the years. It got really big uh, by the 1940s, and uh, they were, it really helped the local economy. Then, you know, as time went on in the 1960s and 70s, it turned more of a folk school for adults. In fact, they'll tell you in orientation if you go down there that this is a um, this is like summer camp for adults. You go down and make cricket ashtrays and bring them back to your friends or <laughs> <laughs> unlevel furniture. <laughs> That's actually a really great place because they teach everything from blacksmithing to uh, storytelling to music, everything. It's a lot of fun. So we're going to let this train get by. <laughs> You think it's that far off? I guess you could keep talking as long as we can hear you. I'll keep talking then. <laughs> as long as we can hear you. So over the years now, they hire people to come down. That ain't going to work. <laughs> I tell a ghost train song. A ghost train story. Is the school still open? Yes. Yeah. No, 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 it uh, cost too much money for a hippie to go. <laughs> they had hippie instructors. <laughs> they do weaving and Oh, yeah, spinning. yeah, everything, cooking. One year the music class was above, they had a chocolatier, a chocolate guy in the basement. We were above him, gosh, yeah, I couldn't teach. That smell would just drive you crazy. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> I knew this would happen. <laughs> I have yet to, to do anything here. That train hadn't run past. That's a three engine. It'll be a while. <laughs> You know, something that amazes me about that, those diesels, I, I like steam, and I'm I'm a certified steam engineer. I went down and took a class on it and everything, and it takes four diesel engines to replace one steam engine. That's how powerful they are. And those things, you know, they're whistle blows, and you hear that, and it's pretty much town limits that you hear that, but I have been all the way out past the lake and heard a steam engine coming and had time to get back here to see it. <laughs> that sound carries much much better. We can hear the trains from Royal Retreat out in Cedar Springs. Oh yeah. Well you hear them blow in Marion and then you hear them blow. You can hear it all the way. Oh yeah. Off in the distance it's that loud. Huh. <laughs> I'm almost sure there'll be another engine on that, so <laughs> Across from the kitchen, yes. cannabis, cannabis dispensary. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> the, we we've just we just had a committee meeting about that. Uh, they're going to fix the farmers market. Well, yeah. I mean, we're starting with farmers market, and then once that money's gone, then we'll move on. And try to keep expanding. Well, yeah. If, if people would come, that's the trick. I, I'd, I'd love to see it, but I don't think you know people show up for Heritage Day, and that's about it. Yeah. Uh, but did you come to Dr. Pepper Day? We had a rockabilly band from um, Gatlinburg. They were really good. And perfect weather. Yes, it was a beautiful day. What, what was that? I said the weather's been pretty nice. Oh, yeah. It was nice over there at Matthews today. Did they charge the plant? I mean, is there a charge to go to that? No. No, it was, well, sometimes it is, but it was free today. There's the last of it. Okay. So now we'll do the recap. <laughs> John C. Campbell Folk School was established in 1925. So over the years, they started branching out and offering classes all over the country. So they hire instructors to come in, even from Oregon, <laughs> In here in Appalachia, uh, like I say, the last 20 years I've spent down there teaching guitar and banjo with them, you know, week-long classes. So <clears throat> the, the school has expanded over the years. The buildings have grown, the acreage has grown, it's gotten bigger and bigger. The oldest uh, building on the campus is called the farmhouse because that's what it was. When Olive Campbell set the place up, the farmhouse was the headquarters to start with. That's where they had the office and stuff. And, now they've built big, even a dance hall. It's a really beautiful place if you ever get the chance to go. So I've been teaching there for several years and you get to know the other instructors. Of course, they rotate in and out, different people every year. But uh, there was a fellow that I knew that was down there and uh, he was in the farmhouse. And one morning, let's see, this would have been a Thursday morning. I was sitting in the cafeteria and he come in, he didn't look good at all. And I said, you okay? I said, you don't look too good. He said, I didn't sleep a wink past three o'clock last night. I said, well, you sick? And he said, no. He said, you're gonna think I'm plumb crazy. And I said, well, I already thought that, you'll be all right. You're here teaching. I mean, we're all got a little screw loose. So he said, no, he said, they, they have these little digital clocks down there in every room. He said, I woke up, rolled over and looked at the clock. It said 2.59, and this was in May. It was real warm. In fact, you know, they're, they're into nature down there, so the windows are up on all the houses. Not You know, you can use the air conditioner, but they encourage you to keep natural, so we had the windows up. So with the windows up, nice breeze, 2.59, and just as quick as the clock flipped over to 3, the door to his room started shaking. Ch -ch 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 and he jerked up in the bed and the door stopped shaking and he said he exhaled and he said he could see his breath when it come out. And he had read about things like this. So he laid back in the bed and he pulled the covers up over his head. The only thing exposed <laughs> was his hands and his face. And he said, Jim, he said, you ain't gonna believe this. He said, something come and sit down on the edge of that bed. And he said, I could feel it feeling in my face and it was definitely female, but it was like, for wet fog feeling on my face and hands and he said it made me that much scared her and finally I got so terrified I said get out you're not allowed in here get out stop bothering me get out of here so it left instantly so he was telling me and I said well I said I mean you obviously think it's real it don't matter what I do or not I mean you had an experience here and he said I'm I'm afraid to go back up there tonight and I said, well, I said, let's go to the, the school folklorist. So David Brose was the folklorist at the time, and he, he was a good friend of mine. And we walked into the, the office, and I told the guy, I said, so you won't, people won't think you're crazy. Let me handle it. I'll, I'll talk to him. 
So we went in and I said, David, you know any ghost stories about the, the, the campus here? Any ghost stories connected with the, the uh, Campbell Folk School? And he said, oh yeah, back room of the farmhouse, upstairs, all kinds of stuff happened there. <laughs> and uh, I kind of was taken aback by that. And I looked over at my friend, he was worse shape, and David looked at me and he says, what happened? <laughs> and so my friend told him the story. And David said, oh, wow. He said, this is incredible. We need to go tell Jan Davison, the president of the school. And the guy said, I don't want that. Jan, I think I'm crazy. He said, ah, oh, Jan, Jan's not judgmental. We'll go see Jan. So we went in his office and he tells Jan the whole story and Jan rears back and he says, oh yeah, back room of the farmhouse upstairs. <laughs> and uh, he says, uh, you know, this is quite a compliment to you. And the guy said, I don't feel very complimented. And he said, well, well, why is it a compliment? He says, she... He said, she only appears to good instructors. And this has happened over, you know, I never saw her. This, <laughs> this, is, this has happened over several years, you know. And she said, we need to go see um, the, the housing director. She's kept a file on this stuff. So here are the three of us, or four of us now, go, go to see the housing director. And uh, Jan said, Jim, you say something to her. So, okay. So he, he wanted to see her reaction. So we went in and I said, Hey, Karen, I understand you have uh, know something about the ghost stories connected with the school. And she says, oh, just a second. She turns around, opens the file cabinet, pulls out a file that thick, throws it down on the desk, says, go ahead and read it. <laughs> so, and she had kept, she'd been there for over 20 years, and she kept track of everything, every occurrence. And sure enough, most of them were in the back room of the farmhouse upstairs. And the one that, that I really remember looking at that really stuck out in my mind, they had changed that thing around. There was a stairwell and they didn't have enough room, so they put in a spiral staircase to take, take less room. So there's this big open space, like a loft. And uh, this woman has been seen standing there in the air where the floor had been. She's just standing there. And uh, <laughs> so Jan looks at my friend, and, and he says, you know, we can put you in another place tonight. And the guy says, nah, well, he said, I'll admit I'm a little spooked, but he said, it won't happen again. Ain't no way. It's, it's, it's gone. And I said, you sure about that? He said, yeah. He said, it'd be all right. So I stayed with him. I went down and sat on the porch of the house till, oh, I guess 10 o'clock or so. Uh, and uh, then I went back to my dorm. And next morning, I was sitting outside the dining hall pretty early. And here he come. And I knew he didn't look good at all when he went up. And I said, well, what happened? He said, I'll tell you when we get inside. So we went inside and we got our breakfast. We were sitting there and he said, unbelievable. I rolled over, 2.59, clock said. Three o'clock rolled. And that doorway went, <laughs> and he said, I reared up in bed and said, you can't come in here. I told you to stay out of here. You don't belong in here. Stop bothering me. Go bother somebody else. I don't need to know I'm the best instructor in the place. Go, <laughs> go somewhere else. And he said, when he said that, the door went chink, chink, chink chimp and he heard the footsteps going down the hall and i said well that's pretty good you told it to get out and it worked and about the time i had just finished saying that this woman ran in and said oh my god there was something in my room last night she was three doors down from me <laughs> i've kept track of him and uh he has been back in that room but he's never had another recurrence but like i said i never saw her i never I must not be much of an instructor on that. <laughs> All right. Are we still spooky? <laughs> Let's see. Try to keep track of the time. <clears throat> I've told this one quite a bit, and this is, this is one of my very favorite ghost stories. And uh, I was at a summer camp. And, you know, doing this type of thing, there's usually somebody when you get through will come up and say, oh, I got a story for you and all this stuff. So I was at a summer camp, and I was telling, telling some stories one night, and we were talking about Appalachian history, and we got on, I was telling some stories about the Melungeons, and some of their stories were really scary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so he's telling me these, telling these Melungeon stories, and a fellow come up to me afterwards, and he said, uh, he said, you, you know a little bit about the Melungeons? I said, well, I grew up in southwest Virginia. I said, no, a little bit. He said, well, I'm from Kentucky, and I'm one of them. I know all about it. And I said, yeah. And he said, what do you know about John Swift's silver mine? Now, 
this is something it's it's out there but you have to hunt for it the swift silver mines a, a, a an old old legend um a fellow named jonathan swift in the 1700s uh found a bunch of silver and of course it's lost you know one of the lost treasure mines uh stories so I said, well, I know a little bit about it. I mean, we, we used to hunt it when I was a kid. Of course, we'd, you know, just playing around, but you get out in the woods and run around and look for signs of early Europeans, <laughs> that type of thing. So he says, so you know about Swift Silver Mine? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. He said, well, I found it. I said, now, wait a second. <laughs> why are you here? If you found the Swift, Swift Silver Mine, why are you here? And the guy said, well, he said, kind of a long story and it was we sit there till four o'clock in the morning <laughs> he uh this guy was quite a treasure hunter and he had done that you know didn't look a thing in the world like indiana jones he was <laughs> he was in his 60s and had a little pot belly on him and you know wasn't very dashing or daring looking but he had he had made uh, a small fortune hunting lost treasure and instead of being out in the woods hunting like we did he would ch do the paper chase so this story of the Swiss silver mines actually begins in the 1500s. 1544, DeSoto hit the west coast of Florida, Spaniard, and he was after the gold and silver. It's mine. You know, I deserve it. These people don't deserve it. It's mine. I want more of it. I, I, so they came all the way up. They used to think they never, never got above Georgia, but I've seen the rock carvings. He made it plumb into Ohio. All the way, terrorizing the Indians. Where's the gold? Where's the silver? I deserve it, not you. It's mine. So they got up into Ohio and turned around and went back south, and he died on the banks of the Mississippi. The uh, the Indians uh, finally rose up and pretty much wiped him out. I don't. He only had three hundred men, and not many of them come out from that expedition. So you jump from Swift. I mean, you jump from there to Swift. So in the 1700s, Swift was in a tavern in uh, Williamsburg. And he met a fellow named Mundy. And Mundy had been to Seville. All the records on the Spanish uh, explorations in Seville, and he had dug through them. And Mundy had a map of Swiss silver mines. I mean, of the Soda silver mines. Now, when the Spaniards would go in, when they would discover gold or silver, in a valley, they would do three pathways in and out to keep the Indians guessing. And these, these, uh, some of these mines were manned by Melungeon. They had bought them in. So when you come up into a valley, there would be a rock carving showing you where to go next. And that's the carvings I've seen. It's pretty amazing stuff. So they kept the Indians guessing. Well, when the Spaniards pulled out, you know, that's, they left, left the Melungeon. So that's where that supposedly came from. So Swift had the, had Monday had the map and they organized an expedition to go into Southwest Virginia and actually it's in Kentucky, according to my friend, <laughs> to find this mine. So they got over in there and they had, they had pretty good bunch of manpower, you know, so they got in there and they found the remnants of the mine. So they dug as much silver as they could all carry and started out. And on the way out, Monday and uh, Swift got a little greedy. <laughs> and they know this, according to my friend, they know this because they had the diary of one of the Indian guides. This uh, Indian guide said in the night, Swift and Monday went up and cut the throats of every other man on that expedition and then buried the silver. So it's mine. Hmm. I deserve it. I want more of it. Same type of guy as DeSoto was. So they got back to Williamsburg. Swift went to London to procure uh, investors in their process. And, you know, it was very secretive. And when he hit the dock in London, they arrested him because he'd been a pirate. So he went to jail. Now, one of the ways when they were coming out with all the silver, they got into some skirmishes with the Indians. One of them had hit him upside the head with a tomahawk. So while he was in jail in London, he went blind. So when he got out of jail, he came back to Williamsburg and he was hunting uh, Mundy and Mundy had died of a fever and apparently took the map with him. Oh. <laughs> so Swift would form expeditions 
and they would come all the way up here, all the way into Kentucky. And they would get to a point and he would say, yeah, okay, this is it. You go away and leave me a day. Come back and I'll have it. And he would crawl around on his hands and knees looking for that silver. He finally died. They never found it. So my friends tell me all this. And I said, well, that's quite a story. He said, yeah, but you don't understand. He said, I found it. And I said, how'd you find it? He said, I went to Seville. He said, I found the soda's maps. And he said, I poured over that stuff. And he said, I was out one night and it was getting late. And I hit an area and I found it. It was there. I know it was there. And uh, he said, but darkness got me. He said, I had to get back down out of the mountains. So he said, he come out of the mountains. It was completely dark. And he was going to go back the next day. So he went to home and he called his girlfriend. He said, I've got some big news for you. I want to have a romantic dinner. And I'm going to really tell you this whole story about, you know, life's never going to be the same. So she fixed dinner and he went over there and they had a nice candlelit dinner. And they were sitting there and. He's getting ready to tell her the news. He said, I had the most amazing thing happen today. And as he's saying it, he told me two figures walked through the wall. One of them had on a breastplate and a helmet, and the other one was dressed in buckskins. And he shook his head and thought he was too excited for the day. And he said, I really need to tell you about this. And he said, one of the figures said, you can't have it. It's mine. And he said, it had a real thick... English accent. You can't have it. It's mine. The fellow in the breastplate was a little more faded than the fellow in the buckskins. And he thought, okay, it's just my mind working on me. He started to tell her again. He noticed that when these fellows would breathe, the candles would flicker. See, that scared him even worse. And he said, look, I'll have to tell you tomorrow. I'm going home. I'm, I'm not feeling good. So he went out and got in his car and he was driving off and he thought, well, maybe I imagined it. And Looked in the rearview mirror and they were sitting in the back seat. Yeah. <laughs> and once again, the fellow says, it's mine. You can't have it. It's mine. And so the only thing he knew to do was drive to a pastor's house. So he drove over to the preacher's house. He's sitting there blowing a horn. And it's late at night, you know, and the, the pastor comes out. He said when the pastor touched the door handle of the car, the guys in the back disappeared. So the pastor got in the car and... My friend told him the whole story of Swift and DeSoto and all that. And the pastor said, you know, he said, I don't, I don't know what you saw. I can't tell you whether that's real or not. That's only for you. He said, but these things sometimes happen as a warning. He said, I think I'd be aware of that. And so he went on home that night and he told me all night long, he dreamed about people with cut throats and skeletons dancing with silver and all night long. And when he got done with that, I said, well, okay, so you're not going back, are you? I mean, this is, this is it. And he says, are you kidding? It's mine. I deserve it. I worked really hard for it. You're darn right I won't go back after it. Now, I lost track of it over a 10-year period. And I picked up a book one, one night in a bookstore, and it was John Swift's Silver Mine. And I'm flipping through it, and there was a photo credit from my friend. And I had kind of been thinking about getting in touch with him, but I didn't know what town he was from. So here's the photo credit, and it had all that stuff in so I tracked him down. I called him, and now he didn't like to talk on the phone about that stuff because the government, you know, <laughs> IRS. And uh, I said, look, I said, I know you don't want to say this on the phone, but I got to know, did you go back? He said, well, no. I said, uh, okay. He said, I can't go in the mountains anymore. I said, well, what happened? He said, the day I was planning on going at work, two big air tanks dropped off the top of a shelf and hit me and broke my back. He said, I'm paralyzed from the waist down. I can't go back. And I said, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I said, I guess you'll leave it alone now. He said, are you kidding? No, sir. He said, I'm going back. Sometime I will go back. And that's the last I heard of him. <laughs> And we're going to tell Deputy Buller stories. <laughs> That's some pretty scary stuff. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Let's do, let's do some locals here. 
this is a this is one of the strangest stories I believe I've ever heard. And I, I've got to, I'm not going to name any names, but you all, some of y'all longtime residents will recognize what happened. Um, <clears throat> the truck stop on the other side of Whiffle, there was a Vietnamese guy in there that was the dishwasher. And he was very well liked. Uh, people thought a lot of him, he was quiet, you know, like all those news people where they'll say, oh, he's quiet, I never knew he was there. You know, so he was still well liked, but he just didn't have much to say. Well, if you remember, they found him one night tied up and really assassinated. He was hog tied, and uh, this is going back several years. And uh, they assumed it was some sort of mob type of killing um, connected with Vietnam. Uh, like I said, the guy never talked much, so they didn't know much about his background. Well, it was soon after that, <clears throat> when they, after they found the body, soon after that, anybody in there late at night, you know, those industrial washers make distinctive sounds. So you've got your tray full of dishes, you slide, open the door, slide them in, shut the door, hit the switch, it washes and the door comes up and they come out the other side. So late at night, they started hearing that. They'd hear the door open and shut and the thing kick on and come out the other side and they would run into the kitchen and there would be no one there, nothing out of place, no problem. Well, guy from here in Rural Retreat was working down there in 1993 when the, the, uh, the big winter we had that year. And he was down there for a week solid. And to sleep, he would go in the kitchen and lay down on one of the tables. Because he could get home. I mean, you all remember that year, it's like three foot of snow. Mm -hmm. So one night he was laying in there and he heard it. He heard the door open up. He heard the tray slide. He heard the door shut. He heard the thing kick on. He jumped up and jumped off the table and ran over. And there's nothing out of place. The dishwasher sitting there with the doors open on it. Nothing. And the noise stopped when he approached it. And he was backing away from it trying to figure out, once again, did I dream this or not? And he hit a cup and knocked it off of a table. And when he went to retrieve the cup, when he bent over and looked under the table, he saw a man from the waist down, pants, shoes. So when he saw that, it scared him. He jerked up and looked. There wasn't nobody there. And he looked back down under it again. Still nobody there. So he's been up for like 48 hours, so he assumes, you know, it's just, just in him. So that night, you know, he went on to sleep. The next night, same thing happened. He heard the rattling of the dishwasher and all that. Jumped up, ran over to it, nothing. Sitting there open. But this time when he approached it, the noise got louder. <laughs> Till he got right up on it, and then it just stopped. And he turned around and looked, nothing. No out, nobody, no way. He started out, and he walked past the table, and he thought, I've got to look. So he leaned over again, and sure enough, here's a guy in brown pants from the waist down. Well, he went straight to the manager, and he said, you're getting me a room at the motel, or I'm quitting. <laughs> so he went over to the motel and stayed, and so then, you know, time went on. He never heard anything else, and several years went on. And he told me he had to be in there one night late, and he heard the noise, and he ran in there, and he wasn't no way going to look under that table. <laughs> but he heard the door open, he heard all that, and he ran in there, and nothing out of place, nothing going on. He turned around and just happened to look at the gas stove and saw the knob turn by itself and the gas come on. And he stood there just a second, and the knob turned and cut off, and he looked around, he said, whatever you're cooking, I don't want no part of it, I'm done. <laughs> so he ran out. But apparently, this is still going on. You still... The oven cuts on by itself. The stove cuts on by itself. You still hear the dishwasher and stuff running by itself. To this day, uh, as of two weeks ago, somebody told me that that was still going on. <laughs> Is everybody creeped out now? I got to admit, that one creeped me out. <laughs> well, I better, you can find out. I better not say. I'll get in trouble. The uh, fellow that experienced all that, though, his name's Billy. <laughs> <laughs> That's truth. <laughs>
Those of you all that know can ask him, he'll tell you. <laughs> There's a story there. <laughs> <laughs> let's see last year about this time you know I usually do a Halloween thing for Facebook and, and the ghost stories I put it on my YouTube channel so there's two years of that on there now uh, last year we went all over the county and went uh, to some haunted locations and I told the stories at the place and one of the places we went was the log house and uh, the employees and the owners will tell you there's all kinds of weird stuff happening in there. There was a, uh, that log house dates back to 1775. So it's been there a long time. Sometime around 1900, it was converted into apartments. And it stayed apartments up through the 1930s. There was a fellow that lived upstairs in the, in the back section of the old log house uh, that was pretty despondent about something, and he hung himself. I mean, that's that's fact. But now, over the years, people have seen a shadow in there hanging, and it's a fellow on on a noose. You tell make out the body swaying and stuff. And I'd heard several people say that, and so I talked to uh, the owners, and they agreed to let me in there. And you know, and I really don't want to see any of this. <laughs> But I thought it'd be neat to do the stories there. So here we go in there, and uh, we got up in that section, and of course I don't want to look. <laughs> but as we were walking up the hallway, a door opened and shut by itself. I mean, right there in front of us. And my wife screamed her lungs out. <laughs> and I ran straight up to the door, and it was on a two-way hinge, and I ran up there and pushed it to see if anything would have caused it naturally to open or close it had a window in it nothing no no way that that could have done that there's just no no reason for that so that kind of freaked us out so we went back to the front of the house and the upstairs room let's see if you're facing the building it'd be the upstairs room on the left um apparently a family was living there at some point the pre-apartments so this is going back a ways and a little girl up there died of thrush. And her mouth was messed up when she died. And over the years, numerous people have been eaten and come down and said, hey, that little girl up there needs some attention. And there is no little girl. Now, I didn't want to see that either. <laughs> lots of doors opening, lots of doorknobs turning, lots of noises unexplainable, all that over the years now. So it was like, what two weeks after we were there filming that it burned and the fire started in the kitchen and went up into the attic and just raked across the whole roof of it and really didn't harm the structure too bad but boy it, it really it really gutted it and they poured millions and millions of gallons of water on that thing now i was at john c campbell when this happened somebody sent me pictures of it <laughs> but all that water now here here's a really funny thing now, there hadn't been any activity ghost-wise in that place since the fire. I've asked them. No one's experienced anything. Whatever was there got burned out. <laughs> but when they poured all this water on it, they were aiming toward the roof because that's where the fire was. All those thousands and thousands of gallons poured down through that building. And uh, the greens were there, the owners you know, washing it. They didn't know what they were going to do at that point. The fire was so bad. All the fire departments around here were there trying to put the fire out. And once again, thousands and possibly millions of gallons of water went in there. So those of y'all have been in there know they had the little kerosene lights on the table. So they went home that night. And after dark, somebody called them and said, hey, you all need to come back up to the, the restaurant. And they said, why? And they said, well, you've left the lights on downstairs. Mm -hmm. And so Mr. Green came up and went in there and, you know, had to unlock the door. <laughs> Nobody had been in there. And there's like six of those little kerosene lanterns on tables sitting there burning mm -hmm. on different tables. After thousands and thousands of gallons of water had poured through that place, mm -hmm. there's six lanterns. And I wonder if that was just a farewell thing or not. Because <laughs> there hadn't been any activity since then. <laughs> Everybody still with me? Yeah. Okay. 
Let's see. Um, the, you know, the best stories to me are the ones that you think about later and go, huh. <laughs> it's not so much as a, a, a tale that you, you uh, when you hear it, it's not that bad, but when you, when you go home and think about it a couple of days, that's when it really hits you. And uh, this one is uh, one of my favorites that does that type of thing. Um, you know, like I said, performing or playing music or wherever you travel all over. and You can get some good stories from National Park people, but they don't like you to use their names. <laughs> and a lot of the parks will fire you if you start spreading ghost story stuff. And uh, Civil War battlefields are really bad about that, that sort of activity. Um, I've, I've heard numerous stories about that. And the, the, I've got two that really stick out in my mind. And the first one, um, my father was working up in Louisa County. And, you know, you're kind of centrally located to a bunch of, a bunch of um, battlefields there. And Dad bought a metal detector. And uh, he was going to go metal detecting. And people were finding uniform buttons and all that. Well, a lot of times you find that stuff, it's a grave. And, of course, it's illegal in the national parks to do that. But adjacent to the parks, there's usually a farmer's field or something that you can find stuff in. Well, that's what he was going to do. And he had all these big plans about it and bought a pretty nice metal detector. And the newspapers were getting uh, a lot of stories about a guy that was going into the national parks with a metal detector, finding graves. He would dig them up, rip the buttons off the uniform, what was left of the uniform, steal the belt buckle. And uh, Dad knew the guy. So he told, he, I remember, you know, I was just little, but he was telling, he's talking about going metal detecting, but he said he, he wouldn't risk going to jail for it. But this other guy was doing it. <laughs> well, <laughs> make a long story short, they found the guy one morning sitting up against a tree. And uh, he had a handful of buttons. And he had dug down used a metal detector he had located a grave and he dug down into it and it was a union major by the uniform what was left of the uniform he was sitting there in shock and when he got him to come around he said he had dug down there of course they weren't buried too deep you know he dug down in there and said he's in the process of ripping my buttons off and said a skeletal hand come up and grabbed him around the throat <laughs> and then they found him in shock now you know I remember Dad telling my mother this story, and it wasn't in the newspaper because he was convicted. You know, they really they threw the book at him. Dad said, "You know, I wouldn't pay much attention to that," and I he didn't know I was listening. He said, "I wouldn't pay much attention to that," but said when the guy came to work, said he had bruises on his throat. <laughs> the metal detector sitting up there at Dad's house. It was never used. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was up at um, Bulls Run doing a show and I was talking to one of the park employees and I said uh, I said you ever see anything spooky anything out of the way and of course they, when you when you ask that they'll always look around and see, <laughs> see who's watching he said well not here I said what do you mean not here he said well he said I transferred in here he said I'm from Chickamauga and I said, so you were a guard down there or a park ranger? And he said, yeah, yeah. And he said, I'd heard stories over the years about this, uh, they call him Old Green Eyes. And he said, I didn't pay much attention to the story, but he said they had had a reenactment. And let me tell you, you talk about spooky, those reenactors are scary guys. <laughs> <laughs> They're very strange. So... They had had a reenactment that weekend, and it was Sunday night, and him and another gar or another ranger were assigned to get rid of uh, the reenactors that had straggled. So some of these guys will actually hide until the park closes and then run around after dark and all that, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so Chickamauga's on rolling hills, and they had topped the hill, and there was fog settling in the lower areas. So when they topped the hill, they looked down into the fog and they could see a guy in a uniform coat. And he said, oh boy, he says, one of those reenactors is hid. He said, 
let's just run down the hill here and scare him good. We'll, we'll get him out of here. So they descended down the hill and they hit the fog and they were hollering at the figure which was walking away from them. So they were hollering at it and said, the guy stopped and turned around and said, when he turned around, you could kind of see the uniform. It was a union uniform with, a, with you know, the epaulets on the shoulder, so it was an officer. And so the officer started walking toward them. Well, they were yelling that you're not supposed to be here. And when they got closer, the ranger told me they saw his face was disfigured. And they got even closer, he thought, the guy's wearing a mask. <laughs> And he said it looked kind of like a, a warthog. It had a snout and had teeth and, you know, and it had these bright green eyes. So he thought, well, I'm going to fix this guy. So he's going to go down and says, the first thing I'm going to do is rip that mask right off of him. And so they got down to the figure and he said, you shouldn't be in here wearing this mask. We're going to throw the book at you. Reached up and grabbed the mask. And when he reached up like that, hot air shot out of the nostrils into his hand. <laughs> And is moist, and he jerked back, and he looked at his buddy. And his buddy's already on top of the hill. He took <laughs> off running, and he turned around and looked at the thing, and the thing looked at him and said, "You could see the, the moisture, the breath coming out of his nostrils, and those teeth had like water dripping off of them." And he said, "Right then, he lost it and ran." He went home. The next day, he put in his application for transfer and went to Bulls Run. <laughs> Now that one, when he told that to me, I was like, yeah, you know, that's kind of funny. Well, next night, before I went to bed, I was like, ugh. <laughs> I don't want to know about, about that one. Um, the, uh, I was in Hawaii, oh, 25 years ago. And I got to know the uh, folklorist for Wahoo County. And we were staying in Waikiki, which, you know, you have, ideas of Waikiki being, uh, you know, a paradise thing. It's like New York City with a beach. <laughs> it really is. It's beautiful, though. It really is pretty. But this drama specialist was telling me about the Hawaiian night marchers. And the night marchers, that's some really scary stuff. Um, the Hawaiians uh, rival Appalachians in their folk tales and stuff like that. So the night marchers... They don't really know the significance of them, but there are piles of rocks and they've left them. If you go to Hawaii, you'll see a big pile of rock. Well, that, that marks the night marchers path. The night marchers start on the mountains and they walk all the way down the ocean and they have torches. And if you see them, if you look at them and they've been seen walking right through Waikiki, if you see them and you have Hawaiian blood in you and one of those figures is your ancestors, they'll kill you. And uh, he was telling me he was, in, you know, he, he, was, he was a white guy. They call the whites Hallies. So he was in doing a program in, a, in an elementary school. And he had done this program, and he was eating lunch with them, and he heard a bunch of little girls behind him talking. They did not know he was listening. And he said this, the, the little girls were talking about the, the Hallie that was talking about the night marchers, and this little girl said, oh, yes, they're real. And she was telling them that they were at the uh, their house it, house was at the end of a cul-de-sac and there was a night marchers monument at the end of the cul-de-sac and they knew it you know nobody messes with them so they were playing around one night and she looked up up at the edge of the mountain and they saw the torches coming and she ran in and told her father and her father said okay we need to get in the floor here and sit together with your eyes closed and don't open your eyes until i tell you to and one of her uncles who was there had been fishing and he really loved to fish. And he said, oh, this is nothing. That's just, that's just superstition. And her father insisted, no, we need it. He said, well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going outside. So he went outside and the little girl said they all sit there and held hands and they heard the marchers go through the house. They heard them go through the house and out the back door. And they sat there forever, she said. And... After a long, long time, Father said, okay, we can open our eyes now. And they opened their eyes, and it was dawn. So they were kind of excited and weirded out, and they went out in the backyard, and they found her uncle dead under a tree. And he was figuring, of course, the little girls got real quiet, and he did too. 
and he thought that was the end of the story, but he, she said the next day the phone rang, and her father answered the phone, and he dropped the phone and jumped back from it, and she said you could hear her uncle saying, hey, I want to go fishing. You guys want to go fishing? <laughs> and he told me that, and I had to walk back to the hotel through downtown Waikiki about 4 in the morning, and I was real, I'll be honest with you, it really freaked me out. And I got back to the hotel and I thought, I hope there's no pathways in here. And I hit that button on the elevator and got off to one side of it, plumb back in the corner. And I thought, wait a second, chances of me having Hawaiian blood is pretty, pretty, pretty impossible, you know. <laughs> but that, that uh, their, like I say, their folklore is, is just as rich as Appalachia. And we have all sorts of things, you know, I could sit here and talk all night about wampus cats and witches and and um i i think that let's see i've got i can't see my watch anymore <laughs> have i got time for one more yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> let's let's tell a melungeon tale um since we're talking about appalachia and maybe we can exchange some wampus cats or something for some night marchers or <laughs> do a cultural exchange um this is not necessarily a ghost story but it's very creepy um, the Melungeon, like I said, are, there's all kinds of speculation about the people and, and what they are, and it's a, it's a mixture of races. And um, They've done some DNA testing just recently, and they said it was more African than anything. So who knows? Um, but they were ostracized by uh, the Europeans. When the Europeans first got up in the mountains, well, supposedly first got up in the mountains, in the, you know, 1700s they had already been there forever because they were there with the spaniards so they were there a long time so they were ostracized and being a melungeon you know i went to school with some of them and they were you know that's they're dark skin and they have really piercing blue eyes um the uh when the settlers first got up there let's say 1725 1730 you know more and more people were coming in and there's a little village over next to Kentucky and there was a young man there who was getting up the age to marry and he they were he was playing in the woods with this girl that he had a crush on and, and uh, they were kind of playing hide and seek and he lost her he couldn't find her and he sat down on a log and he heard her in the log she had crawled up inside the log, so he knew, you know, she was there. So he picked up a pine knot that had a hole in it. And he held his hand down, and he said, With this ring I thee wed. And she stuck her finger through it. So he knew they were going to get married, you know. So <laughs> when she did that, he just jumped off and ran, thinking that she would chase him. Well, they got back to the house, and she was there. So they were talking, and... He said, you know, now that you've agreed to marry me, and she said, no, I didn't. And, of course, it big argument. Anyway, they got married, and they set up a little cabin, and we're doing really well, and she went down to wash clothes one morning at the creek, and she didn't come back. So after a while, he got worried about her, and he went down looking for her, and he found her in the creek. She had fell over and then drowned. It's just pretty heartbreaking, but he went on with life, and a couple of years later, he got to court another girl, and uh, he, you know, explained to her the tragedies and all that, and she says, oh, said, uh, you know, love conquers all, so they got married, and after they'd been married a while, she started down the creek to wash her clothes, and he said, please don't do that. Go somewhere else. She said, no, it's right there. There's nothing nothing to happen so she went down to the creek and was washing clothes and once again she didn't come back so he took a gun this time went down there and looked around sure enough she's in the creek drowned so another heartbreaking thing so a couple more years went by and you know love <laughs> love really does heal so a young lady got interested in him and kept hounded him and finally they started courting and she convinced him to marry they got married and she was going to wash the clothes and he said no 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 you're not and she said well she said we're going to do this a little differently this lady was smart 
She said, I want you to get some of your friends and go down there the night before and camp and hide. Don't tell, don't tell anybody you're down there. Hide. And I'll come down in the morning with clothes and we'll see what's doing this. So he got three or four of his buddies and they hid in trees and stuff. And next day about midday, here she come with the clothes and uh, she started washing them. And this wild woman run out of the woods and grabbed the girl and threw her in the creek and was holding her head below the water. Well, the men jumped down and got the woman off, off of her and her hair was entangled.